Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Betcher. I'm the manager of special programs at the Museum of the American Revolution. Today, I'd like to read a little from the surviving diary of one memorable woman with a very long German name, Frederica Charlotte Louise von Masso, Baroness Freifrau Riedesel zu Eisenbach. By all accounts, and especially in her own memoir, the Baroness von Riedesel was a fearless socialite who in 1776 left her home in Germany with three young children to follow her husband to Canada and America. Her husband, Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich von Riedesel, was the Brunswick German commander of the Hessian troops serving with the British Army. The Baroness spent her early 30s as a military spouse and mother, an avid reader and writer, and unexpectedly, an American prisoner of war before returning home in Germany in 1784. If you visited us in Philadelphia, you might remember learning about members of the Oneida Indian Nation and their decision to serve with the revolutionaries. Then you would have turned the corner to see these words from a German Baroness who surprisingly served with the British. The biggest quote in our galleries about the Saratoga campaign in upstate New York is translated from her German memoir, remembering, I was more dead than alive. I hope she didn't use that exact phrase in any letters home to her mother about this event. Less than a year before this moment, the Baroness had asked her very worried mother to understand her decision. She writes, Dearest best mother, your last letter has made me almost beside myself. Some passages in it show so much anxiety and love that it makes me right sick to be forced, for the first time willingly, to disobey you. I could not endure the thought of separating myself from you, and yet the thought that you begged me, nay, commanded me to remain here, made me shudder. Yet to remain would have been impossible. Duty, love, and conscience forbade it. This must have been pretty convincing, because the Baroness exclaims in her next letter home, if you could only know how rejoiced I am to see by your letter that you begin to be more reconciled to my journey. The only thing that worries me, dear kind mother, is leaving you behind. But I hope that it will not be for long, for perhaps God may soon grant peace, and then we may be able to pass our days more quietly. Not surprisingly, this wartime diary does not get much quieter as the American Revolution continues. I can imagine the Baroness's mother might have reflected on her initial warning with an I told you so while missing her grandchildren. The Riedesel family spent nearly eight years in North America fighting against another country's revolutionary war. You can also read more from these letters in the Baroness's entire memoir, available and accessible for free online. I'm looking at the English version digitized on Google Books translated from the original German by William L. Stone in 1867. As a local to Saratoga Springs, he was personally invested in updating the original 1827 translation for American audiences. He advises, designed for no eyes but those of her mother and her family, these letters have an unstudied familiarity. It is Madame Riedesel's artless and faithful delineations of the scenes through which she passed and the state of society in this country at one of its most momentous epics that give to her story its highest charm and value. Many historians and authors have retold and added to this story since then, including some of our past speakers at the museum. Dr. Carol Birkin writes about the Baroness in her book, Revolutionary Mothers. Historical fiction author L. M. Elliot has blogged about the Baroness's connections to the Schuyler family, also featured in her recent book, Hamilton and Peggy. If you're eager to discover if any aspect of the Baroness's world might have been lost in translation over the years, I'd recommend reading more about how different sources have remembered her and maybe planning a visit to the revolutionary places that she saw. This memoir's very first readers were the Baroness's own family in Berlin, Germany, first published by her son-in-law in 1800. And yes, these private diaries and letters were published with her permission. Here's the Baroness and Baron von Riedesel later in life in pastel portraits from the National Museum in Warsaw, Poland. The Baroness wrote and organized her wartime papers alongside her husband. This project may have helped her to process her personal memories and also established a public legacy for her experiences. Before her death in 1808, with six children surviving to adulthood, she became famous for her famously charming account 
titled The Voyage of Duty to America, Letters of Mrs. General Redesel Upon Her Journey and During Her Six Years Sojourn in America at the Time of War in that Country in the Years 1776 to 1783, Written to Germany. Reading the Baroness's diary tells us one woman's story of following the army in her own words. In the museum, the Baroness's perspective interprets many objects that belong to other people who were with her on the Saratoga campaign in October of 1777. You can also see archeological discoveries from the New York battlefields that she saw. Other records help us point out that the Baroness was only one of about 2000 women, including other officers' wives, who traveled with British forces under General Burgoyne. Her perspective also contributes to one of our four overarching museum questions. How did the revolution survive its darkest hour? Writing must have been one survival tactic that helped her through times like this one, an especially dark hour spent in the cellar of the Marshall House, a place that still stands today. She recalls on October 7th, with room for myself and the three children and my two maids, thus I followed the army right in the midst of the soldiers who sang and were jolly, burning with a desire for victory. It was a terrible bombardment and I was more dead than alive. Little Frederica was very much frightened, often starting to cry, and I had to hold my handkerchief over her mouth to prevent our being discovered. The greatest misery and extreme disorder prevailed in the army. The commissary had forgotten to distribute the food supplies among the troops. More than 30 officers came to me because they could stand the hunger no longer. My children lay on the floor with their heads in my lap, and thus we spent the whole night. The horrible smell in the cellar, the weeping of the children, and even worse, my own fear prevented me from closing my eyes. I was the only one among all the women whose husband had not been either killed or at least wounded and I often said to myself, should I be the only lucky one? Afterwards, she says, I tried to divert my mind by busying myself with our wounded. I made tea and coffee for them, for which I received a thousand blessings. After the Battle of Saratoga, the British general surrender led to the Baroness and her family's capture as prisoners of war. She remembers that on October 17th, the capitulation went into effect. While driving through the American camp, I was comforted to notice that nobody glanced at us insultingly, that they all bowed to me, and some of them even looked with pity to see a woman with small children there. Does the rest of this diary contain even more dramatic episodes? The short answer is yes. She even repeats the phrase, more dead than alive, more than once, to describe more than one tale. We can read ahead to learn that even as a prisoner of war, the Baroness was still able to see new places before her family's eventual release. From Quebec to Virginia, she writes about her children learning English and befriending strangers, the time she offended an American woman who had offended her first by offering her tea, and frequent updates on sickness, health, and answers to prayer. Since I'm joining you from Philadelphia, I'll tell you that she was sad to miss the chance to see us here, especially noting to which place there is a clear good road, only miles from where she stayed in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. If you've tried journaling yourself, you can empathize with the Baroness that it can be hard to find the words to describe tough situations. Whether you're having a dramatic or a dramatically boring day, some of you might be finding new inspiration to keep your first diary or sketchbook right now. Or maybe you already have shelves and shelves of diaries at home. Does it help motivate you to flip back the pages and reflect on what you thought about a certain situation weeks or even years later? What makes keeping a journal worthwhile for you? The Baroness couldn't have known that I would be reading her from her diary today, <laughs> but I'm glad she wrote down even the most mundane details from her time in America. When her days felt especially long, I like to think that the Baroness might have found the encouragement to continue on her journey by going back and reading her own writing. If she'd ever doubted her reasons for leaving home, like her mother had at first, the Baroness might have recalled her family's initial reunion when her little Frederica was even littler. Crossing the Atlantic Ocean in 1777, she writes almost daily starting in April. 
I know not whether it was the hope of so soon again seeing my husband that gave me good spirits, but I found the sea not so dreadful as many had painted it to me. When the children were sick, I asked whether they wished to persevere or go back. They answered, oh, we will cheerfully be sick if we can only reach our papa. On the 26th, we again had a fair wind and made some headway. On the 27th, the ship staggered so dreadfully that many were again attacked with fresh sea sickness. I often fell down. One of my daughters had a finger crushed by the swinging round of a door and the other hurt her chin. Ouch, that's not a great day apparently. Later in May, little Frederica never went to bed without praying for her father. And once after one of these prayers, she said to me, I long to see my dear Papa soon. I asked her what she would pray for when she should be with her father. Then she said, I would pray to God every day that he would never more would separate us. This affected me to tears. Finally, after landing in Canada, the Baroness writes on June 15th, I saw the Canadian come near and fold the children in his arms. It was my husband. As he still had the fever, he was clothed, although it was summer, in a sort of woolen cloth bordered with ribbons, and to which was attached a variegated fringe of blue and red after the Canadian fashion of the country. My joy was beyond all description, but the sick and feeble appearance of my husband terrified me and a little disheartened me. I found both my oldest daughters in tears, Gustava for joy at again seeing her father, and little Frederica because she saw him in this plight and was not prepared for him in this costume. The very moment, however, that he threw off his Canadian coat, she tenderly embraced him. Just in case, reading more about the Baroness's highs and lows from her diary online, or writing a diary entry of your own, isn't next on your list for today. I'll end this episode with a minute to respect the Baroness's courage and creativity even in naming her five daughters. First, we meet Gustava, or sometimes Augusta. Second is little Frederica. Third, Caroline. Fourth, born and baptized in New York, there was America. The Baroness tells us that a son would have been called Americus. And later, while in Canada, a fifth daughter named Louisa August Elizabeth Canada. This reminds me to think of my mom today, who also has four sisters. I admire that my grandma and the Baroness shared the same challenge to name five daughters. I could write her a letter to tell her, but I'm lucky to have the option to call her this afternoon, too. For the Baroness von Riedesel, writing this narrative and letters home helped her and us see the American Revolution as a personal and unlikely global adventure story. I hope you're able to find the peace and quiet that the Baroness had promised her mother would come again soon. If you're inspired to explore virtual resources, read more, or write your own thoughts, let us know at AmRev Museum. Thanks for visiting us today, and we'll hope to see you again soon.